joining. And um, what we're going to be doing today is uh, covering mostly like some basic concepts of Sound Trinity, and also I'm going to be giving you a uh, walkthrough slash demo of the tool. Um, because of my laziness, I have not yet written documentation on the tool for one reason or another, mostly because I'm not because I'm lazy, just I don't have any time. But um, uh, th I'm going to be using this video. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to basically be referring to people, referring people to this video from now on, uh, in terms of just like setting up the tool and uh, like the basic usage of it. So uh, hopefully this will be uh, somewhat informative to everybody. If you've not uh, used the tool, or if you have used it, if you used the previous versions and you couldn't figure out how to get it running. Um, so this is the agenda for today. We're going to be doing a really quick recap of some of the just like the basic concepts behind the tool just to get everybody on the same page. Uh, I already did a previous webinar on like the like going a little bit more in depth onto like the the, the actual details of BYOI, so bring your own interpreter, um, concepts, payloads. Uh, so and I have a link to that in the slides as well. So after the webinar we'll publish it. You can find it there if you want to. Uh, but we're going to be doing a quick recap of the bring your own interpreter payloads, which is what underpins the tool. Uh, and then we're going to be just jumping right in and uh, doing a demo of like how to set it up, how to actually like set up listeners, how to um, run modules and get sessions and all that stuff. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some of the updates. Uh, in the last month or so, uh, this tool has gotten an insane amount of updates uh, thanks to amazing contributions from people. Um, and I think we've like I think there were a couple of people on the if you if you're not in the uh, Bloodhound Slack channel, um, Sound Trinity channel, you should definitely join because that's where all like the development action is taking place with with this right now. But we've basically I think uh, we've basically jumped ahead like six months in in like two or three weeks of development uh, just because of all the contributions. So it's it's been pretty it's been pretty insane and it's awesome. Um, uh, so after the demo, I'm actually going to be showing you how to start writing your own modules. It's pretty easy. Um, and uh, some undocumented features, which hopefully this video will be documenting, that will make your life a little bit easier when, when it comes to actually extending the tool and actually writing your own modules. And then I'm going to be showing you a really uh, weird and quick and easy way to port over existing C-sharp tradecraft, so Red Team tradecraft, over to the tool. Um, which I found out recently using uh, this, I don't think, I personally don't think it's supported anymore. I think it's using this IDE called Sharp Develop, which allows you to basically take C Sharp and then uh, automatically convert it into Boolang, which is what Sam Trinity uses to do tasking. And then after that, we'll be doing some Q&A. So hopefully, uh, I'm going to be breezing through these slides fast just because there is actually a lot to cover. Uh, but hopefully, um, this will just give you some basic background on, on the tool. Uh, so these are the two links uh, that you're probably going to want to have uh, if you, or if you want to refer to them like while uh, the webinar is going or later on. So the actual Sound Trinity GitHub repo, so obviously Sound Trinity is open source if you're not familiar with it, it's on that GitHub uh, repository there. Um, the offensive DLR repo is sort of contains like proof of concept uh, scripts and uh, tools that sort of give you an idea of like how to actually go about weaponize and like bring your uh, bring your interpreter payloads um, and all that stuff. So that's definitely something that you might want to uh, take a look at as well if you're interested in this stuff. So um, what is bring your own interpreter? So bring your interpreter payloads, I've started coining this, is basically basically just embedding any third party .NET scripting language into another .NET language. Okay. And um, I got some really ghetto graphics of uh, what this looks like in a few seconds, but hopefully that's clear. Uh, that's clear enough. Like I said, like I I've covered this detail, like I think quite a lot. I think at this point, um, the there is another webinar that I did uh, back earlier this year that covered this a little bit more in depth. And also, there's my DerbyCon talk there, um, which I uh, did a demos and and explained this a little bit detailed in content. But the, the fundamental idea is that we're basically embedding a third-party .NET scripting language into another .NET scripting language. And the reason why I want to do this is because this allows us to uh, bring back the good old days of PowerShell style like attacks only without going through PowerShell in any way, shape or form because we're uh, using another 
language, okay? So uh, this is essentially what it looks like. So it, any, so there are a bunch of third-party .NET scripting languages. Uh, Silent Trinity specifically uses something called Boolang. So Boolang was originally developed for the Unity gaming engine. I actually found this out recently at DEF CON. Um, this someone, that someone came up to me and actually told me that Boolang was actually developed for the Unity gaming engine. I had no clue. I've only used it for malware all this time. Uh, but it was developed originally for that. And um, Boolang is amazing for a number of, op for a number of reasons. It, it dynamically compiles and interprets stuff in memory. Um, it supports pinvoke, so .NET interop right out of the bat. So you can like do all the low level stuff that you need as like a red teamer and pen tester, like inject shell code and all that stuff. Um, so we're basically just taking Boolang and embedding it into any .NET language. Uh, so like PowerShell, for example, PowerShell is a .NET language. So you can take Boolang or really any third-party .NET scripting language and embed it into PowerShell if you wanted to. Um, and same thing with C Sharp. So if you wanted to embed Boolang in C Sharp, you can totally do that. And that's actually one of the Sound Trinity stages um, that uh, is available publicly. And um, but it's not only limited to .NET languages, right? So you can in, you you don't necessarily have to embed Boolang in other .NET languages. You can embed it into any lulbin so living off the land binary or uh, any feature really in windows that ingests a dotnet assembly so really anything in windows that interacts with a dotnet framework you could probably get it to execute uh, any sort of dotnet payload or and even like sound journey stager and embed a third party dotnet scripting languages so this is basically what it looks like at a high level so we're, what we're essentially doing is just taking the Boolang interpreter and embedding it in any .NET language that we want to. The reason why we can do this is because obviously they're all based on the same framework, right? So because they're all based on the, underlying, the same underlying framework, they're all interoperable with each other. So you can take PowerShell and embed it into C Sharp, C Sharp into PowerShell, Boolang into PowerShell into C Sharp. Like the, the, all these languages are interoperable with each other because um, they're all based on the same underlying framework, okay? So what at a high level, what all what we're doing is uh, we're taking the Boolang interpreter, embedding it into some feature of Windows that ingests a .NET assembly or some language, okay? And then just throwing source code at it in 4K Ultra HD. It's Blu-ray too, so it's amazing. So you just throw source code at the Boolang interpreter and it just executes. And so basically by doing this, uh, there's a lot of pros by doing this. We're bringing like the back, back the old way of doing things with PowerShell because we're dynamically executing .NET APIs through a dynamic language as opposed to a compiled language, which is uh, what traditional C# -sharp tradecraft um, gives us, right? So there are some. There's a lot of pros to this approach, and there there are some cons, but there there are definitely a lot of pros. One of them is that, like I said, like it. it it really is like PowerShell style like attacks without PowerShell. So you, anything that PowerShell can do, you can do in Boolang. Um, and it's also not limited to a single language. So bring your own interpreter payloads. It's You don't have to only embed Boolang. There's a bunch of the other .NET scripting languages, right? So you can embed Iron Ruby, for example, which is a Ruby, um, a Ruby implementation of the Ruby programming language on top of .NET, right? There's also Iron Python, so which is a Python on top of .NET. There's also some really weird ones. Uh, there's one uh, that allows you to uh, dynamically execute and create web assemblies within .NET, which I still have to experiment with because I feel like that's that's a lot that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, there's also a JavaScript interpreter, uh, which is interesting. Uh, the PHP interpreter. So there's a lot of programming languages implemented on top of the .NET framework. Okay, and the advantage of using uh, these the, those programming languages is, is obviously because that they're scripted languages, right? They're not like C Sharp where it's compiled. So there, no, there, there is no compilation necessary. So Scion Trinity doesn't compile anything server side. If you consider the interpretation that happens client side to be compilation, which depending on the language can be accurate way of describing it, uh, then I guess you could say that it does get compiled client side. But because of the way the languages are usually implemented, um, it all happens in memory. So unlike if you're familiar with compiling like C-sharp within PowerShell, where it leaves 
artifacts to disk. This does not happen with um, third-party .NET scripting languages because of the way they're implemented. Uh, and because of this, this also mean it, by consequence, this also means that it's also by design like anti. It sort of has like anti reverse engineering built in, because what happens is that obviously if you embed, uh, and I'm going to be showing you some source code um, during the demo, so hopefully this will be a little bit clearer once you actually see the code, or if you want to browse to those repos that I linked before. But um, what this means is that if you opened up a Silent Trinity stager, what you would see is basically just a uh, a compiler instantiation of some kind. So it, you'll basically see like just the boo compiler spinning up or the Python compiler spinning up, or whatever language you decide to embed, uh, really, uh, if you want to make other, if you want to embed other languages. And you won't necessarily see anything inherently malicious, because all the malicious stuff is just source code that gets sent down server side to the endpoint uh, and gets compiled and gets compiled and interpreted dynamically. So the actual, if you do decide to drop it on disk uh, and like, blue team decides to do some like incidents response analysis and decompiles the .NET assembly that you dropped on this, they won't actually see any malicious code unless they have a memory dump. Uh, they'll only see like the boot compiler being stood up and um, and and just like uh, some URL call, like some HTTP or C2 channel calls to a specific URL. So it's inherently by design like anti uh, sort of, yeah, anti reverse engineering, I guess. So it's, it's very OPSEC safe. Uh, and also another benefit of doing this is if you properly instrument these BYY payloads correctly, um, it, you'll automatically just bypass AMZ because you're going a level deeper, uh, especially, and this is a little bit clearer if you start playing around with this with PowerShell. And if I have time, I might show you like a, a good demonstration of this, but um, like if, especially in PowerShell, if you properly instrument them correctly, like you'll, it, AMSI really has nothing to signature on. So it's just like by default, sort of a straight up AMSI bypass. Um, so the, the cons, obviously, there are some cons to this. Um, embedding these languages sometimes is not usually straightforward, especially if the languages have not been developed that much. Uh, with that being said, I have yet to, uh, at least the ones that I've tried embedding, I have yet to encounter a language that I, I just couldn't embed or just couldn't throw source code at it and execute it. So um, while there probably are some quirks to each of them, um, yeah, it's definitely like not as straightforward, obviously, as just like using Visual Studio and compiling uh, a C-sharp binary. But the beauty of this system is that you don't have to install Visual Studio at all because it's all source code, right? It's going back to PowerShell. So you can just use Sublime Text if you want to and uh, encode this stuff uh, just server-side or client-side um, with just like a, a simple IDE instead of like all the overhead of installing a development environment. Uh, another major con is up until recently, at least up until um, a recent discovery mine, is that you couldn't really take advantage of C-sharp tradecraft because obviously you'd have to take the C-sharp code and existing C-sharp tradecraft like the ghost pack stuff or really any like post-exploitation C-sharp tool. Uh, and convert it over to the language you're embedding, right? So in Silent Trinity's case, you'd have to convert uh, like C-sharp to Boolang uh, all manually. But at, so, but recently, I actually discovered that there's a um, very old uh, C-sharp, third-party C-sharp integrated development environment, IDE, that uh, they has a plugin that allows you to automatically convert C-sharp to Boolang. So because of that, this problem, at least for Silent Trinity's perspective, is kind of solved. Now, obviously, it's not 100% perfect. You're going to have to do some edits here and there. Um, but like I've, I managed to completely com uh, port over Seatbelt from the Ghostpack repository, which is like six, 7,000 lines of code uh, in like 15 to 20 minutes, as opposed to a week or two weeks, uh, because, you know, 6,000 lines of code. So it's, it's, a, it's, Definitely a hell of a lot faster using this, and uh, hopefully, uh, if I get enough time, I'll, I'll definitely demonstrate it because it's pretty cool. So that's that's pretty much someone solved. Um, and hey, as, Marcello, someone yeah. wanted you to expound a little bit on the anti-RE. Yeah, sure. So, so if we go back to this graph, right? Um, what by anti-RE? So it's it's a lot more offset safe than traditional C sharp graph. So traditional C-sharp tradecraft, you just have a binary, 
you compile with all your code in it, right? All your malicious code in it, you compile it and then drop it on disk or um, yeah, that's usually like how it usually gets deployed. You can inject it in memory and all that stuff, but usually it's just a binary that gets dropped on disk or reflectively injected. Um, by, by using BYY payloads, what you're essentially doing is dropping a payload on disk. So the actual, so if you do decide to drop it on disk, what you're gonna see if you decompile it is just an interpreter, that's it. Uh, and the actual malicious code is what gets sent down to the, uh, the to that binary. So the only way you actually get to see the malicious code is if you have a memory dump, right? Because it's all it's all in memory. Um, and obviously, like there there are ways of doing this with C sharp, but the thing is, it's a it's usually a lot more overhead because you have to compile stuff server side in order to actually get it to execute client side. Uh, you have to usually obfuscate it. With this approach, it's all source code, right? So server side is just the source code that you that you just basically send down to the endpoint, and it gets compiled on the compiled or interpreted, whatever you want to call it, on the actual endpoint itself. So if you were to open up a BYY payload, yeah, decompile a BYY payload, you would only see like the boolean compiler being instantiated and like some URL. Call, like calls to some URLs. That's it. You wouldn't actually see the malicious code. Does that explain the? Does that answer the question? Uh, I think that does it. Okay. Sweet. Are there any more before I move on? No, cleared hot. Okay. Okay. So, as of let's see here. Uh, what is it? Like six, seven hours ago, I guess. Eight hours. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um. So Sound Journey version 0.4.5 has been released and it's fresh off the presses. In the last like two to three weeks, there have been 50 new modules added to the tool, which is kind of amazing. Uh, thanks to some amazing contributions. Uh, there's now process migration injection, which is really, really cool. Uh, especially if you start like, at least I think it's really, really cool just because of the underlying implementation. But um, there's also lateral movement stuff. There's UAC bypasses. There, there's like recon modules. Like it, it's, I think we're up to like 70 modules at this point, which is really cool. Um, and there's also some like for the lulls modules that like change your wallpaper and, and make Thunderstruck play and uh, like a full speaker uh, volume, like that kind of, kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so the, a lot of new modules, um, amazing stuff. And also uh, the error handling has been improved everywhere. And I mean, everywhere, like it's it's kind of, um, I would dare to say like almost stable now. Um, and listeners have been completely revamped. So if you played with this tool before and uh, you did have some trouble uh, figuring out how to get the listeners running or just like doing some some of the basic stuff with the listeners, that's because there were a lot of bugs in it. And uh, I think I pretty much fixed all of them. Ah, that's famous last words. Uh, and there's also unit tests now, which is crazy. Uh, this is the first project I've actually written unit tests for. So th this is somewhat like legit project now, I guess, because of the unit tests. Uh, and hopefully that will make stuff, that'll make stuff break less often. All right, so that's basically the gist of uh, Silent Trinity, and we're just gonna dive straight into uh, the demos now. So everyone, let's just start praying already to the, uh, to the demo gods here. So, okay. So the way Silent Trinity is implemented is uh, as of the latest, as of the, the latest releases, is a team server client architecture. So if you're familiar with Cobalt Strike, uh, there's a client, right? And there's a team server. You stand up the team server anywhere and then you connect to it, the client. It's the same thing uh, with Silent Trinity. So uh, you have a team server. So once you download it and install it, um, and the installation process is pretty easy. You just git clone it and then you run pipenv, which installs all the dependencies, and then you're good to go. Um, but at, at, once you install it, all you have to really do is st then stand up the team server, right? So the team server accepts two arguments. Uh, the actual interface where you want to stand up the team server on, in this case, on the local host. Uh, the, if you're familiar with Cobalt Strike, um, the interface where you stand up the team server on isn't bound to the listeners in Silent Trinity as opposed to Cobalt Strike. So you can stand up the team server on any interface that you want and 
you can set listeners to other interfaces. That's that's not a problem. Um, and then you set the password uh, to the password to the team, team server, uh, which in this case is just password because you know why not, right? YOLO. So once you start out the team server, um, it does a bunch of stuff. And uh, again, like very similar to Cobalt Strike, you'll see that it give you gives you a team server fingerprint. This is actually really important. Uh, because this is really the only way of knowing uh, if someone's man in the middle in you when you actually connect to it with the client. So it's very important that you do like like Cobalt Strike. It's very important that you do check this before doing anything else. Um, excuse me, in the client. So once we got our team server stood up here, we can now connect to it, uh, and you do that with uh, the client. And so the client uses WebSockets. Uh, and because it uses WebSockets because this way we can have real uh, time communication between the team server and the client. So like if you do get a shell on the team server, it'll just automatically fire an event and the, and it'll just communicate it instantly to the, uh, to the client. So it's all real time. Uh, so the way you connect to it is you have to give it, this is one of the, like the quirks of the tool, is that you have to give it a specific URL. So WSS stands for obviously encrypted WebSocket connection. So uh, WebSockets over TLS, and uh, it's very important that you do put two S's there, just because otherwise it will all go in plain text. You then get the username followed by the password of the uh, team server, and uh, the interface that wherever the team server you stood up the team server at, and the port, which by default is 5,000. Okay, so we stand that up, and now you're connected. Now. Um, and from here, like you, you have access to the entire client menu. Now, obviously, uh, it's a team server client architecture, right? So what this means is that you can um, you can connect to it with multiple clients, obviously, right? And it also supports multiple servers. So if so, you're doing stuff over here, and then you got your coworker or your friend that wants to share the the glory of plundering the network, right? Uh, you go over to the sign, you go back to Silent Trinity here, and then you fire up another client which hopefully will be in my history here. There you go. And you have to give it a different username, obviously. So we're going to do user2, right? Connect to it. And that aired out because I am not in my Python virtual environment. There you go. So we connect to it. And there you go. So we're now, we're now connected to the same team server with multiple clients, right? Uh, and it's all real time. And you see that the previous user that joined got, gets a little message saying, hey, a new user joined. And uh, this way you can share the uh, the glory of plundering the network uh, together, right? I'm just going to close this out because uh, the font is too big as it is. So um, I want you to, yeah, so this is probably much better for you to view. So once we're in the actual Sign Trinity client, uh, there are, again, like the documentation is not there yet. So I, 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 as I say in the readme, like make wild use of the help in dash h uh, arguments and commands. So there is a help menu, there is a help command that uh, on every me menu that gives you a list of all available commands, which makes things a lot easier. Uh, so uh, like obviously if you want to interact with listeners, you type listeners and there you go. Uh, but you, there's also modules depending on like, which context menu you're at. So if, if you're familiar with Metasploit or Empire, you'll find yourself at home. It takes, I, I've tried to take the best of all of those worlds, including Cobalt Strike and combining them into, into this. Um, so yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll see it's very similar to what you'd expect. Um, so after that, we're gonna go into the listeners. We're gonna stand up a listener, right? So you go into listeners, type help. You'll see you have a bunch of options. Uh, I'm just going to list out the available listeners. So ev not only does the menu have a help option, but every command has a help option. So if you just pass it, pass it dash H, uh, you'll see that every command gives you a little uh, argument uh, help menu. So in this case, you can see by the output, it says, hey, if you want to see the available listeners, you just pass it. Um, dash A. By default, it gives you the listeners already running. So obviously, if you just type list, it won't give you anything because no listener is running. Type dash A, you'll see there's only two listeners available. I have more in the works because HTTP and HTTPS is obviously boring, uh, but these are the ones that uh, by far work, work, I guess, by far work so far. Uh, so these are the ones that are included in the, um, 
stable version, somewhat stable version. Uh, so once we decide on what listener we want to use, we're going to use the HTTPS listener. You just type use HTTPS. You also probably noticed by now that there are some pretty fancy autocomplete features here. Uh, I personally hate tools that don't autocomplete, so I make sure that everything that can be autocompleted in Sun Trinity is autocompleted, and everything that can't be autocompleted still is autocompleted. So you'll find that a, big, a lot of things are autocompleted. Once we choose a listener, you type options, and uh, gives you the options of the listener and in all of its glory. So uh, from here, as you'd expect with like a list listener menu, uh, you get to set the bind IP and stuff. Um, you'll notice that also the options are <laughs> completed. So if you want to type uh, bind IP, there you go. And um, depending on how many IPs that the team server has, it'll auto complete the IPs as well, because that's another neat rant of mine. Um, and then, the port, we're going to set to 8443 because I did not run this as root. And then when you're all ready to go, uh, you type start. Perfect. And if you played with this tool before, uh, you already noticed that this, this is different. <laughs> the previous versions didn't even give you an indication that the, uh, the listener started. Uh, so uh, now that error handling has been put into basically everywhere that I can think of, uh, it actually gives you a message uh, that I started listeners. And before I go on, is there any questions? Yes, actually. Uh, someone want to know, does this integrate with Metasploit? I'm not sure how that works. But... Um, no. However, uh, it's, you can. Technically, you can because of the way it's, it's, it's uh, implemented. But unfortunately, like, I, I, I kind of want to get this working on itself before I even think about that, uh, obviously. But like, you, you, could, you totally could actually integrate this with Metasploit in the sense that you could write a Sun Trinity listener that supports the Meterper protocol, if that makes sense. So it would be like a native, um, I guess what would it, be? it would be like a, a native Meterpreter listener, I guess, built into Sun Trinity itself. That makes awesome. Sense. Yep, thanks. Cool. All right, so we got a listener. Um, so now if you type list again, you'll see that we have a listener. Uh, start up. So now you have to generate a stager. So stagers, uh, like I said before, right? They're just uh, a .NET language that embeds a compiler of some kind, right? Right now, Sound Trinity only supports the Boo language because it's by far like the one that I found to be the uh, most operationally viable, I guess, in terms of uh, red teaming and testing that kind of stuff. Um, so you'll see that. Uh, Boolang is the only language that's currently supported. I do have plans for integrating other languages, especially once Iron Python 3 comes out, which hopefully will be next year, but I doubt it. Uh, but if Iron Python 3 comes out and they do fix a lot of the stuff that I found to be wrong with it, uh, hopefully uh, I would love to embed that as well. Um, for this demo purposes, I'm going to be using the, st the stageless PowerShell uh, stager. So this particular one, isn't publicly available. I'm going to be using it because um, I don't think it isn't publicly available. I, I might release it in a while uh, because I kind of want to use it at least a few times before I actually burn it and publicly release it. Uh, but basically, this is as opposed to the normal PowerShell stager, which is currently on the GitHub repo, where it basically takes a C sharp assembly, which embeds the Boolean compiler, and then embeds that within PowerShell. Uh, this is just a, this, this sort of gets rid of the middleman of C-sharp and just takes the Boolang interpreter and embeds that directly into PowerShell, and then it executes the uh, sound trinity stage that way. Uh, and because of this, there really isn't um, a lot to signature on. So you'll see that because of .NET 4.8, which was recently uh, pushed out to all of the Windows, uh, the latest Windows 10 builds, which integrates AMSI into .NET itself. Uh, you'll see that a lot of the C-sharp tradecraft uh, that's been working pl pretty flawlessly so far uh, is going to start getting a lot of errors and it's going to start getting caught by Defender. Uh, that's because of the latest .NET 4.8 update. Um, because of the way Boolang works, and like I said, like I said before, if you properly instrument the payloads, you really don't have to worry about AMZ because of the dynamic compilation that happens uh, client side, the compilation slash interpretation that happens client side. 
Um, but once you generate a stager, these are the ones that are currently available. Um, you need th this is what you're gonna actually get to execute on the endpoint, right? So I'm gonna be using the stageless PowerShell version. Um, once you select the power the stager you want to use, you type options. Um, if the stager has any options, usually they don't. And then um, once you're ready to actually generate the stager, uh, you just type generate and then you give it the listener name, right? So our listener name was HTTPS that we stood up. Um, so uh, we're gonna wanna generate that towards the listener. So it automatically takes care of taking all of the IP addresses and ports and URLs and putting it into the stager, setting all the crypto up uh, so that uh, it'll automatically connect back to you encrypted uh, once you execute it and it just dumps it to your uh, clients file system. Uh, so if we open up uh, that real quick, uh, you'll see that we have a handy dandy stager.ps1 here, and this is the uh, stageless PowerShell stager, for lack of a better way of calling it. I still have to figure out a good way of what to call that exactly, because it doesn't actually stage, but it is stageless to some degree. Um, so these are, this is my test VMs here. So we're gonna be compromising this domain here. I'm just gonna paste this in and I'm gonna replace the previous one that's here. Now, obviously in a real world scenario, uh, you're gonna wanna execute that somehow, um, either using like other tools publicly available or getting like any anything that'll execute PowerShell. Um, I'm just gonna, for demonstration purposes, this is probably easier, so I'm just gonna do this. Um, and once we execute our stager here, Uh, we hit yes because we want it to actually execute and uh, we are good to go. So now if we go back to our server here, you'll see that it says we have a new session. Awesome. That was working so far. I think I might have just jinxed it there actually. Uh, so we got our session now, and I just want to point out that um, this, these are the latest Windows 10 builds. So I'm doing this all uh, latest Windows 10, and Defender is, I think, turned on. Should be. Hello. There you go. Yeah, so everything's turned on. Oh, no. Okay, well, maybe. Uh, okay, too late. I guess Microsoft might get my malware, but it's fine. Um, but yeah, everything's turned on. Defender's turned on. This is the latest Windows 10 build. Uh, just to show you that real quick. There we go. So what is this? This is 1903.18.362. Which I, I downloaded this like the other day. So unless they just released a new build, I'm pretty sure this is like the latest one. Um, so there you go. So this is all latest, greatest Windows 10 build. Uh, so now we got a session. Uh, we are going to want to actually do stuff, right? So to actually to actually like, execute modules, um, this is going to look somewhat awful just because of the font being big. Uh, but there are now a lot of modules. Uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of dumb ones just to demonstrate like some some of the features of this. But um, like the message box, for example, because the um, the actual implant itself uh, is asynchronous. So if we just if so if we execute like a, a job that's running uh, that's that's longer so if it long runs for a long time or if it blocks uh, it'll the the actual implant will keep calling back for more tasks and it'll just execute them concurrently uh, so once to actually use a module you just go over to the modules menu type use and then the module name and then uh, options to see all the modules options. So if you're, again, if you're familiar with Metasploit, this is pretty straightforward. And then you type run and then the GUID name, right? Uh, oh, hi. What's going on there? Hello. Did I just... Oh. Okay. Hold on. There you go. That works. Uh, so the GUID of the session, actually, I didn't show you that. So if you go over to the sessions menu, uh, so you'll see that the whenever, whenever a new session connects, you'll see the name of the session. You can rename this. Uh, but usually it's the GUID and it auto completes anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, if you want to see like some info, like other info about the uh, session as well, you could type info and the, from the session menu info and then the GUID name. 
and it'll give you like a, a bunch of other information that it gives back upon initial connection. Uh, so it'll give you all of the network addresses, which is something that I always wanted, uh, but not a lot of uh, C2 tools actually do for some reason. Uh, and uh, you know the OS and the process ID that it's running under, and the sleep time, which you can customize now. I'll get into that in a second. Uh, so if you go over to the, back to the modules here, options, and then just type run and the session GUID. And then uh, if we go back over to our uh, thing here, there you go. So we got a little message box here. And because it's asynchronous, what this means is that uh, we can just keep queuing these up, and it'll just keep popping message boxes, right? Because it, and if you're not familiar with like C Sharp or Windows development, like the, uh, whenever you pop a message box, it's a, it's a blocking call. So like the entire thread usually just, um, so this is just, just a really, a uh, quick way of demonstrating that. Um, and because of that also, uh, the the actual results of it get returned back in real time. So this is the uh, the output of those modules that gets returned back to the server. So before I go on, I just want to point something out. And this is like the, one of the main benefits of the flexibility that this system provides you, OK? So I'm just going to zoom in here real quick. This is the source code for Sound Trinity. Um, and if you go into the modules folder here, and the source of the modules, um, and we go to the message box thing that I just demonstrated. Um, marketplace extensions can't help with both files. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Okay, so this is the, I don't know why, it did, yeah, I did have syntax enabled for Boo, but I guess, you know, demo gods, right? Um, so this is the, it's, it's like four lines of Boo, so this is Boolang. Uh, it's four lines of code. This is just to pop the message box, right? Because, like I said, it's just source code, right? So this is what actually is getting executed client side, uh, like on the implant. Uh, so what that means is that you can edit this real time. So if, if you didn't want it to return popped uh, to the server, but you wanted to like edit it, VHIS uh, demo, right? You can edit these on the fly. And uh, if we go back and execute this module again, and we go over here, there you go. I'm in your computers. Yeah. Okay. Click OK. And then you see that it now gives us back the actual value that we modified. Okay. So this is like the main, one of the main benefits of using the system is because of the flexibility that this provides you. So like if some of them, like if I screwed up and like one of the modules uh, that I wrote isn't working, you can go in and actually edit this on the fly without tearing down the team server, without compiling stuff. And again, like no, no compilation is happening server side. You're just sending down source code and it's executing it client side. Uh, so this is, it's literally, you're just dealing with text. That, that's, that's literally all you're dealing with. And, and that's the, uh, that, this is one of the main benefits of, of using the system is because of the flexibility. Um, all right, Marcello, you've got tons of questions in here. Okay, go on. Are you planning on adding any peer-to-peer -peer comms? Yes, yes, that is a really good question. So there's this thing in .NET called WCF, Women's Communication Foundation. And I've been playing with that a lot recently. And it's basically a way of hosting .NET services on the network, but it, it's basically also a way of making peer-to-peer -peer malware. Um, there are, so it's basically an alternative to SMB named pipes. I feel like the SMB named pipe thing, I think at this point has been, um, used all to hell, which is great. And um, like, it still works, don't get me wrong. But I think like, in terms of like stealthiness, I think the SMB peer-to-peer -peer name pipe thing is, is sort of uh, out the window at this point. So um, I, I'm, I'm gonna hopefully take a different approach and use WCF. There is some pretty decent problems that you're gonna have to, where I'm gonna have to try to solve in order to get that working. Uh, but the capabilities that, I, that would provide would be amazing because it supports automatic discovery of nodes and cr automatically creating mesh networks, um, like uh, inter, inter, inter protocol routing, routing nodes, like you could technically like pivot to other machines without doing any remote port forwarding stuff. Like it's just crazy stuff. Like if you're interested in like peer to potent, like peer to peer malware and stuff, definitely take a look at Windows WCF because um, that that's just crazy. But yes, that, that would be the, uh, the way to go with this, I think. Excellent. It says, what connection types are used for HTTPS? Does it beacon? How often is there jitter? Yes, good question. So uh, by default, it uh, beacons every 
five seconds, uh, you can customize that. So let's see, again, like similar to Cobalt Strike, right? So if you go to sessions here, list. Uh, so uh, you can see that the output of the sessions button gives you the last time it checks in. Um, you can cu you can um, customize the check-in interval by just typing sleep. And again, like if you don't remember these this, this specific syntax of a command, you can just type dash h, right? And it'll just give you what you need to give it. Uh, so it, sleep takes the GUID of the session. So uh, there we go. And then the milliseconds of the interval that you want it to sleep in. So say I wanted to, this for it to check in like every 10 seconds, I'd give it 10,000. And now um, the next time uh, this checks in, uh, It'll, there you go. So now it'll, it'll tell you it'll now check in every 10 seconds. Uh, it also does support jitter. Uh, so if you wanted to make it uh, make it like connect back with a random interval, you, it's basically the same syntax for that. And you can do that with the jitter command. Um, what else? I think that you can make it automatically uh, force it to check in as well if you wanted to. Awesome. We've got quite a few questions. I don't know how much more you've got to go. I don't yeah, want to just give me, give me Yeah, two more. Two more. All right. Um, does Trust Silent Trinity support domain instead of IP? Domain instead of IP? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not. I'm just using IPs here just because it's like my internal lab network. But yeah, absolutely. If you if you did this like if you actually set this up for like a red team engagement, yeah, it would totally work with that domain. It's no problem. Excellent. Here's a question, and I think it's why Boolang. <laughs> Wow, that's a really good question, actually. So, Boolang is the only um, third-party .NET scripting language that I found so far that allows you to do p invoke. So, uh, so .NET interop. So, actually calling unmanaged functions and loading unmanaged DLLs um, from .NET. So, like all of the low-level Win32 APIs that you need to do in order to inject shellcode and um, and all that stuff. Boolang is uh, the only scripting language, third-party .NET scripting language that I've found so far that supports that out of the box. Um, Iron Python does support it, but when you try to do that within a Iron Python compiler in memory, uh, it just breaks. Uh, so unfortunately, and that's one of the things that I'm hoping that they'll fix in Iron Python 3 so that we can actually write modules in just Python, which would be fantastic. Uh, but Boolang is really close to Python. Like if you know Python, um, it's basically like I, I say it's a love child between C sharp and Python. It's got some of the same same constructs of each language. Uh, so it's got like the using statements here, and I'm not sure why Visual Code just crapped out on me and decided not to color this, but uh, I guess you know. Ah, boy, demos. Uh, but but yeah, so uh, it, like it supports the same constructs like the for loops, ifs, uh, using is basically context managers in Python are familiar with that. So like it's extremely similar to Python in, in almost every way. Uh, so it, it's it's more than close enough for me. Well, the questions are coming in faster than we can keep up. I think we have to let you proceed on a little bit. We'll try to answer these offline. Sounds good. Okay, so uh, let's go back to this. All right, so now uh, to actually do something like meaningful, I guess, um, I'm gonna be showing off the mini dump module. Okay, so this is this is one of the biggest updates that um, the framework has received so far. Um, actually, you know what? Before that, I'm gonna show you the fancy PS module. Uh, so this just lists the current processes. Um, but uh, what's really cool about it? So if you're familiar with uh, Harley Quinn, uh, Harley Quinn's aggressor script repository, uh, which is he just wrote like a bunch of like add-on aggressor scripts for Cobalt Strike. There's one in particular that I love, and it was the process, um, the process listing. There you go, the, the colorized process listing, which shows you, um, which colorizes like specific processes that are meaningful. Uh, for lack of a better way of describing it. Uh, so that is now in Silent Trinity in the PS module. So it'll show you, it'll colorize like specific processes that are somewhat meaningful, usually like from a, in an engagement perspective. So like it'll colorize in red, uh, the Windows Defender process. So there you go, that's, uh, and it'll, it also has a list of like common EDR product processes as, as well and, and a, like key pass and a bunch of like developer tools 
Um, so depending on like VM tools, it'll colorize that. The, the background text is white, but this is usually, this is gray, so it's hard to see. Um, but uh, so this is one of the newest editions as well. It also gives you some really contextual important information, like uh, if it's a managed process or not, um, and the integrity level of the process and the parent process ID and so on and so forth, uh, and the username associated with it. Um, so that's this is that's definitely one of the newest modules as well. Um, uh, but the the coolest one, I mean, there's a lot of cool ones, but this is this is definitely like uh, another really good one. So. The mini dump module uh, basically dumps LSAS, right, uh, from uh, from Boo uh, to disk. So it, it doesn't use Mimikatz. So Mimikatz is never executed actually on the endpoint. Okay. So it just takes it just dumps the LSAS process to disk uh, using the mini dump write dump API if you're familiar with that, uh, and then uh, chunks uh, compresses the dump, chunks it up a, uh, a certain uh, bytes at a time and sends uh, each chunk to the server. Uh, the server takes all the chunks, puts them back all together, and then uh, gets the creds out of the dump using PyPyCats. So if you're, if you're not familiar with PyPyCats, check it out. Skelsec is, is by far one of the smartest guys I think I know. Um, he, he writes a lot of this uh, stuff. Like he, he basically wrote a uh, mini dump parser, basically a Mimikatz implementation in Python. Um, so what that allows us to do is, is take the, that memory dump and parse it server side as opposed to on the endpoint. So uh, what, what we're doing on the endpoint is just executing a Win32 call and all of the credential parsing happens server side, right? And this, uh, this actually also demonstrates a lot of the cool features of, um, of Sign Trinity too. So I'm gonna run this module and, um, ooh, hello. Well, I didn't mean to do that, but it doesn't really matter because it's executing on the team server, so it should be good to do. All right, there you go. So it seemed to have executed. Not in a high integrity process. Yes, it is correct. I'm not in a high integrity process. So I'm going to cheat here and I'm going to start up another one. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, instead of, I'm going to go back to that in a second. I'm going to actually show off the lateral movement module. Okay, so this is, this is, there you go. This is the WinRM lateral movement module. So we're going to be executing Mimikatz now on, a separate machine that we move laterally to, that's going to be a high integrity process. And this is going to uh, run the Silent Trinity stager. Oh boy. Oh my God, we're almost out of time. But uh, this is going to execute the Silent Trinity stager uh, on a remote machine using PowerShell remoting. So it'll just basically uh, execute this, the same PowerShell stageless script only through PowerShell remoting on the machine and get us a session that way. Uh, so I am going to set a bunch of options here. So the stager, I'm going to set PowerShell Ooh. stageless, just because the other one would get popped by AMZ. Um, host, I'm going to set this to, what is this? One. Yeah, there you go. Listener uh, HTTPS, which is our previous one. And then I'm gonna set the credentials. Actually, I don't think I need the credentials because I am in, let me just double check that real quick. Uh, yeah, so hold on, let me see if I can just make this a little bit bigger. There you go. So, uh, I think this should be admin already to that box. Correct. Okay, so I don't even need to specify credentials. Yay, I could just do this, this, that, and I should be good. Let's try it. So what this is gonna do, it's gonna send down a Boolang task to that, um, there you go, to that machine, and it's gonna hopefully Execute. Ah, perfect. There you go. That worked. Wow. It even worked in the demo. That's fantastic. That's when you know something works is if it works in the demo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, basically what that did is sent down a Boolang task uh, that uh, and automatically populated that Boolang task with the code, the PowerShell code that contained the Silent Trinity Boolang interpreter, right? And then uh, connected to the machine that we, the other machine that we specified um, over PowerShell remoting executed it there and that 
then connected back to us. So now we have a, a session on the machine that we move laterally to. So see, you can see here, like we were at that 70, now we're on that 72. Uh, we're in a high integrity process. If you're familiar with Empire, it gives you like the little asterisk there if you're in a high integrity process. So now we could execute Mimikatz or that mini dump module. Ooh, damn. Okay. Well, ignore that. Uh, use boo mini dump. There we go. Uh, we're going to execute that on the other one. And this should hopefully give us some creds. See what happens. So it was interesting. Perfect. Okay, so now it dumped LSAS um, and it's now it compressed it and it's now uploading the chunks to us one by one, right? Uh, we since we don't have all day, uh, we're gonna make this uh, faster by going over to sessions menu and telling that session to sleep um, for uh, one second. So now every second, actually, I'm just gonna make this interactive. Uh, yeah, that was a bad idea. Yeah, because I don't want it every second. That's that's way too slow too. So I'm just gonna say zero. I'm just gonna make this interact. There you go. So that's much faster. And again, like this is like uh, Defender is running. So I just want to point that out. I think that's uh, I think that's a very important thing to to say here. Okay, so one minute. Some people want to know if you've run this against Silence or. Carbon black, I think I saw. Yeah, yeah. So um, if white if whitelisting isn't a thing, usually uh, it bypasses a lot of that. Um, the only thing that the, it usually triggers on is like in this particular module example. Uh, so th these are the creds, by the way. So this is uh, it uploaded the LSS dump, parsed it with PyPyCat server side, so nothing, no means cats was executed on the endpoint. Uh, so that's that's cool that it works. That's amazing. that's a, I'm kind of surprised that it even worked in the demo. Um, but yeah, no. So if whitelisting isn't a thing on the endpoint, usually uh, you can get around silence and like not silence specifically for legal reasons, but um, <laughs> uh, but you can get around a lot of EDR solutions. Um, it, they usually trigger on heuristics more than anything. So like in this particular case, you'd be touching LSAS from PowerShell, which is usually a pretty good indication that something's um, that something is malicious. Uh, so that's why that's when like uh, these, that's why you have to properly instrument and actually know what a lot of these models are doing just to avoid that situation. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it does bypass a lot of stuff. Excellent. Um, yeah, and one more thing, one more thing before we go, and I think I'm already like low on time, but I just want to show this real quick. Um, modules, so it recently, we, I recently integrated Donut into this. So if you're not familiar, Donut is an awesome tool that allows you to take a .NET assembly, convert it into position-independent shellcode uh, so that you can inject into a remote process. Uh, it's just black magic. Uh, you should totally follow the Wover, though, on Twitter because he is the man that, uh, and Odzan, but I don't think Odzan's on Twitter. Uh, but uh, you should totally follow him on Twitter because this man's uh, did a, a lot of work to this. And I wrote a, um, a Python C extension to integrate it within Silent Trinity. So now in Silent Trinity, there is an inject module, which allows you to do process migration, which is awesome. And uh, it's hard to see because it's off, but I'm just gonna give you a quick demonstration. You get a process name, Explorer. Explorer. I'm just gonna give it, oh, there you go. Uh, I'm going to give it explore to inject into set listener HTTPS. Uh, I forgot the session that we're on. Okay, sweet. So uh, run, and then we're going to give it uh, the first one. So hopefully now what this is going to do is uh, send down a boot task, which has the shellcode uh, for the C sharp silent trinity stager. Uh, and inject that into the explore process. Uh, what you'll notice though, so the C-sharp binary, uh, which is on the GitHub rep repository, obviously is detected by uh, basically every AV in existence at this point, uh, but uh, you'll notice that we'll still get a session anyway. And that's because, if it works, you know, famous last words, but um, hopefully it will, usually it takes a while. Oh, there you go, perfect. 
wow, this is amazing. The fact that this is working in a demo is just blowing my mind right now. Um, Bomb proof. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is, it was worth it. <laughs> um, so uh, you'll notice that we got a session, and that's because a Donut automatically uh, puts in an AMSI bypass uh, into directly bypasses AMSI by uh, when it spins up the CLR in a non-managed process. Uh, so it doesn't matter what we inject into with Donut, it'll usually always get through AMSI just because of the shell code of like the shell code itself. Uh, so now we have another session um, in Explorer this time. So if we were to like just to, I guess show you, I'm not cheating here. Um, this is in Explorer. There you go. And I think uh, at this point, um, we are pretty much over. So I'm just going to wrap this up real quick. But that, that's basically like those are the biggest features that have by far, um, um, the, uh, that have by far been implemented. Uh, one, actually, you know what? One more thing before I go, just because I'm here and I'm going to take advantage of this. So um, what I told you before about the sharp developed thing. Let me see if I can pull this up in a fast amount of time. There you go. So Sharp Develop 4.4. So this is one thing to note. So they, there, there's the latest version of Sharp Develop does not support the C Sharp to Boolang trans compilation, uh, if that's what you want to call it. Um, but it's pretty simple. Like literally all you do is once you install it, uh, open uh, or new rather, right? File. Uh, then you C Sharp class, right? And then you literally go out to any project here. And I'm going to just go uh, Excel for decom because I know this is pretty simple and it'll probably work like right off the bat. There you go. So say you wanted to port over uh, Vershell's Sharp for decom C Sharp awesomeness, and this basically just executes shellcode via the Excel for macros on the uh, on a remote host. So you literally just go to the GitHub repo, copy and paste this over to Sharp Develop. There you go, and then you go to Tools. Convert code to boo, and it converts it for you. And then you can now take this and copy paste it into a sign Trinity module, and you're good to go. Like it's Holy literally. Holy mackerel! Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that's critical right there. Yeah, yeah. So this is. I just want to. So it's that easy. Now, obviously, sharp. Uh, this particular project is somewhat simple. So like the Bool, the Boolang translator. Uh, didn't have an issue with, but there's a lot of sheep, C sharp isms that sometimes you're going to have to manually go and sure. yourself. But um, this this is a this is a hell of a time saver. And I managed to convert the entirety of Seatbelt, uh, which is 6,000 lines of code, using this in under like 15 minutes. Like this is a lot of code. I just want to point that out. Um, so like it it it, it really does help, uh, especially with like some of the ginormous. Um, script I like c sharp stuff that is out there so amazing um well done hey who are your shout outs to somebody asked you to echo those shout outs that you just gave a couple minutes ago oh yeah the wover definitely um daddy cocoa man which i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing that correctly uh but uh him definitely on twitter uh oddsan which i don't think he's on twitter if you go to the silent trinity uh read me um basically all of the people in the contributor session you should probably follow absolutely i definitely say that uh, those are the people that did the hard work. I just put stuff together. So, <laughs> yeah, that's the, so that so definitely do that. Uh, and they're all in the readme there. Um, and uh, yeah, pretty much that's it. So um, you got some homework to do because there's a bunch of good questions. Yeah, and I yeah. think we need to try and get those answered after the fact. Here, we'll capture those. Sorry, the yeah. questions. There were just so many really great questions. I knew Marcello was kind of under the gun to finish this up. Obviously, we got one minute left. Uh, Jason, yeah. I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, um, Marcello, I would just say, do you have any final words for everybody? Um, and then we're going to kill the recording and then stick around for a few minutes. Uh, yeah, actually, you know what? I have some final words. Wait one second, which sounds really awful, but I'm not going to die or anything. Don't worry. Wait one second. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, not that. Yeah, there you go. Um, I'm just going to leave that there. <laughs> I let it be known. Those are my right. <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in for today's Black Hills webcast with Marcello talking about Silent Trinity. Uh, thanks, Marcello. Thanks, everybody. Oh.